Thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation. And I have to start out by saying I think I've met every one of you in this room today. And if you haven't, it's not without good attempt, because Peter put together a good list here. <laughs> and it's great. I'm glad to have the opportunity to visit with many of you. And I'm glad to be able to connect with the rest of you. And, um, and I'm, I'm really glad to be able to talk about what we're talking about today. You know, in fact, Terry asked me to come here a year ago. And, we weren't able to make it happen, and in a large sense, I'm glad that was the case because I can stand before you today with a lot better news than I probably could have a year ago. Um, and you know, I, I think the thing is, I was a grad student once, and, and uh, when I finished my degree, I had no idea what industry was about. I didn't prepare for industry, knew very little about it, and so I'm glad to be here, nothing else to have an open on discussion about what industry is and what it does and, and talk a little bit about potential opportunities. You know, you can make decisions, but uh, if you don't know what it's about, how do you make those decisions? I'm going to start out by saying what this lecture is not about. It's uh, I'm not a recruiter. I'm just an average Joe, I'm a professional skier that went bad. <laughs> and uh, I, I uh, I'm a plant pathologist, and I ended up having the fortune of getting into industry. What I do want to do is have an open and honest discussion about industry. So any questions are valid. You can stop me as I go. We can entertain them at the end, whatever you see fit. I want to provide you with a better idea of what people do in industry so that you can determine for yourself if it's something that you would like to do or not. And hopefully, I'm doing this for a reason. I'm doing this for a reason because I think all of you probably do want a job sometime. And the good news is that industry really needs to help people. There are a lot of people in industry that have hair that's the color of mine, and we're in need of lots of people to come in that are smart and talented, and that's what uh, is good. I mean, the timing is, couldn't be better. What do I mean by that? There's a coalition of sustainable agricultural workforce. It's called Seesaw. Things have been kind of up and down with Seesaw over the years. Sorry, I didn't say that. Um, but uh, Seesaw actually is it's a coalition, so it's, it's, there are 16 companies and several different organizations, as you can see in this tree, that came together, and I don't remember the exact year, but several years ago, to try to ascertain what is the workforce and industry, and what do we need, what are our needs. And the good news is about a month ago, the big six, Syngenta, Dow, Bayer, BSF, DuPont, and Monsanto, came together once again, and they consolidated what they found. I'm going to share with you, I've actually filtered these directly from the website. These are slides that were generated by Seesaw. They said that they're looking for molecular biologists, geneticists, molecular biological informatic people, ecologists, groundwater ecologists, non-target ecology, environmental scientists, environmental chemists, toxicologists, environmental modelers, Entomologists, plant breeders, plant pathologists, plant physiologists, regulatory science folks, toxicologists, statisticians, and weed scientists. So this was a list that was compiled by those six companies in the Seesaw. And didn't mean to put entomology and plant pathology down there. As I said, I built for the slide, or otherwise they would have been on top. Um, but what they're seeing in terms of those jobs, fitting 84% of those hiring positions by the year 2015 are going to fit within three disciplines. And that's going to be your plant science, plant breeding and genetics, plant science, and plant protection. There are other jobs as well in regulatory. And 40%, 46%, so almost 50% of those will likely be PhD positions. About a quarter of them will be masters, and the other quarter will be uh, people with bachelor's degrees. There's also a strong agreement among companies that the pipeline for graduate students probably isn't large enough fill the needs. So that's good news. Um, it means that there's going to be more jobs than people. We need people. So that's good for, for people looking for jobs. Um, and they anticipate challenges in finding these quality folks. And it's mostly difficult in hiring educated people that meet these needs. I'm not sure I fully support the last statement, but that, anyway, that's in your slide. And here's where those jobs are. So they're projecting that going from 2012 to 2015, there's going to be an increase in global market of about 6.3 percent. That's 3,500 jobs. There are more people work, working in the in this area in Europe <coughs> than there are here. 
year. But that's, that's a significant amount. But the key thing for domestic jobs is that that will increase by 13%, so projecting about slightly north of 1,000 jobs in the next several years. So what I would like to do today is talk to you a little bit about what is industry? What in bloody heck do we do? Um, what types of jobs might there be for entomologists and plant pathologists? I want to talk a little bit about the myths versus the facts of working in industry, and then what might you do to prepare? Now, when I re refer to industry, I'm basically referencing the multinational companies. These are the big companies, like the big ones you just saw in the last slide here, there on the bottom, that basically have business, global businesses, they have disease control, insect control, weed control, and often have genetics traits. I'm not referring to the smaller companies, I'm not referring to genetic, uh, generic companies or private businesses. That's not to say that you can't get a good job in these, these areas, but they're certainly a lot different. Um, particularly generic companies are really around sales. They do very little technical work and very little support. Before I tell you about what we do, I thought I'd take just a couple minutes to tell you what Syngenta's about. Syngenta's a global company. We're globally headquartered in Basel, Switzerland where I had the benefit of being for three and a half years. We have 26,000 employees plus uh, worldwide. And our North American headquarters, so that's the US and Canada, is in Greensboro, North Carolina. And basically, our remit is to help the growers. And small growers and large growers, our ambition is to bring greater food security in an environmental sustainable way in an increasing populous world creating worldwide step changes in farm productivity. And we're doing it through tailored agronomic solutions. We spend a lot of time that, that focus through the eyes of the grower. And we're doing it through seeds, seed care, lawn and garden business, and crop protection. And we have passionate people, a strong platform to do world-class science with a global reach and a strong performance in what we do. And in fact, we spent over $1 billion in annual R&D for our products. We have over 5,000 folks that actually do research and development. And so that's a, that's a pretty big number. We have over 26,000 employees in over 90 countries. And in 2012, we sold $14.2 billion worth of business. We have science all over the world. I'm not going to belabor all of on the slide, I'd like to point out that you know our global headquarters in Basel, Switzerland, I mentioned Greensboro, but we also have a very nice facility called Syngenta Biotech. It's in the Raleigh Durham area. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that location shortly. It's really molecularly driven and they put a lot of money into it over the recent years. We also have a very nice experiment station in Vero Beach, Florida. But you can also see in these other locations where we, we do work um, in, in various areas, be it sugar beet industry, be it flowers business, biotechnology, chemistry in India, we're all over the world. But clearly what we see is that there's a huge challenge in front of us um, in the demand for food, in the limit of space, and also the limit to water. And I think you're gonna hear a lot more about this in the future. Clearly um, we need to utilize water more efficiently. And so really what we have to do is do more with less and in a sustainable way. Okay, so the population is growing. In 2000, in, in uh, 1950, we had 2.5 billion of us on this planet. 2011, that was up to seven, and we project it'll be about nine billion by 2050. So there is definitely an increase in the need for food, um, and land is not growing. I, I usually bring an apple in the night for this, but I've been kicked off too many airplanes to do that, so instead I had one of my colleagues make me a little pictorial thing. If you think about this apple as the world, three quarters of the world is covered with water. You can't grow crops there, let's throw it away. It means we have one quarter of the world to grow crops on. One eighth of the world is inhospitable to people. Polar ice caps, deserts, swamps, 
very high Rocky Mountainous areas, can't grow crops there. One eighth of it is habitable, it's where all the people live. One thirty second is too rocky, too wet, too cool, too steep, and the soil is too poor to grow crops. One thirty second is buried under the city's highways and shopping centers, we can't grow crops there. One thirty second is wildlife refuge, timber, rainforest, and wetlands, most likely won't grow crops there. So we grow crops in one thirty second of the earth. And by the way, we grow it in the top five feet of soil, So, which is represented by this. Normally I'd hold up my little heel. You recognize that's where we grow crops. It's never going to get any bigger than that. So we've got to do things sustainably. We've got to do it right. And that's what we do. Without agricultural inputs, 40% of the world's food would not be here right now. So we are very dependent on agricultural inputs. And what do I mean by them? I mean nematicides, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and this is what we spend a lot of time with. Recognize that we do a lot of things other than that, and I will address those later. So that's just a quick brief view of what we do at Syngenta. What types of jobs might there be for entomologists and plant pathologists? If you think about it, and I'm going to focus primarily on, on that realm that I just talked about, those different types of pesticides for now, and then I'll go into molecular. If you think about discovery, there's lead finding. We spend a lot of time with people that their, their life is finding things, whether it's screening chemical libraries, or it's, whether it's finding things and, and, and doing assays and, and trying to identify if there's biological relevance, be it for weeds, insects, fungi, nematodes. There's a lot of activity around that. We do a lot of really good work. There's also optimization and selection. So we do a lot of work around protein chemistry, around tweaking molecules, around identifying how we can make things better. I'm going to give you a quick anecdote, actually. It's oxystrobin is an active ingredient in the world's number one fungicide. It's our fungicide. Um, it's in many of our fungicides. Zoxystrobin was discovered, well, actually, let me go back a step. There was a Czechoslovakian mycologist who did a lot of hiking in Switzerland. They called Van de Weg. They, he did a lot of hiking through the woods, and what he recognized so every time he found two mushrooms on the walks, one was Strabilurus tenacillus and the other one was Oromatiella musida, he noticed there were dead fungi around it. And he hypothesized that, that those fungi were producing fungicides. And he was right. And he went back and he started growing these in, in culture and he got the extracts and he found that yes, in fact, they are fungicidal. And we started working with these as well. We started testing them. And in the greenhouse, they didn't work. Why is that? Anybody? We have a clue. Why would they be fungicidal in the lab and not work in a greenhouse? They're not all day. <laughs> Light. Light. Who said it? Back here? Light. They were photolytically degraded very quickly. The difference between the forest and the field is light. And our scientists figured this out and they were able to tweak that molecule and make it photostable. This is what I'm talking about optimization. They're able to optimize. And they, in fact, the funny thing about the story, it goes further. We actually patented this oxystrobin 24 hours before PSF did. So we didn't <laughs> punch you. So, uh, uh, all right, so then there's research and development. So there are lots of jobs in research and development. In fact, I'm going to click this right now. Because most of the jobs for entomologists and plant pathologists will fall in these two areas. That doesn't mean all of them will. You can work, in fact, I know plant pathologists that work in, across all of these. So research and development, these are the people that take things to the field. These are the people that are testing them in the field, evaluating them. Um, and you know many of them, you work with them. Um, Dane Bruns is one that works here in, in Ohio, so possibly some of you know him. Registration and, uh, and market introduction. There's a lot, lots of stuff that goes on in this area. Extremely boring, extremely boring. No, I'm kidding. Um, it, it, it'd be boring, I'd hate to do it. But somebody has to do it. And, uh, and so it's an important area to consider. And also product support and life cycle management. So this is, you know, we have to keep the products going. I'm going to show you why in a minute. We can't just introduce something and, and, and not take stewardship lead on this. We need to keep the products around for a long, long time. It takes a long time to develop and it costs a lot. We put a lot of emphasis on resistance management and all the products we develop. We put a lot of emphasis on making sure people, growers, using the product the way they should be used. I'll show you this slide, not so that the, 
study the names as much as you see. These are people that are doing these kind of studies. These are people that are doing field biology studies. And the point I want you to see from this, we've got lots of good people in different areas and they're color coded by where they work. So you can clearly see that some have to work in just one area, like name, but others have to cover several different states and big geographies. And so it, it actually can be daunting. The other thing I want you to know is that if you're Dane and you're working in Ohio and you just want to do pathology, you've got to wear many hats because we're, we're developing these products in different states. So somebody who's in covering the state of Ohio develops mitocides, insecticides, herbicides, nematicides, so you have to wear many hats. So it's, it's an area that requires that. The cool thing is you have to do, you have to do work that's geographically relevant, so obviously um, if you beautiful trees like this, you're working on it. You're working on the crops that make sense for the geography as well as for the company developing, developing them. And obviously we don't spend a lot of time developing products for very tiny crops because it doesn't make sense. Um, and that's what IR4 is for. IR4 develops a lot of things for that. I'm going to share a couple slides that I gave from Dr. Ryan Bounds. He gave this talk at APS in 2009, and it was a year in the life of a field scientist. Ryan is located out in California. And basically, you know, we're testing, sometimes we're testing very new chemistries. And those chemistries, if you test them in the field, you have to do a crop destruct. Well, obviously, you don't want to destruct a almond tree. So he came up with a clever way of taking the blossoms, putting them in vermiculite. He can screen them with various products, and we can get really very relevant and excellent data and not have to destroy anything. What Brian said, the top five things of his job, he loved about his job, one was that he He's into science, but he's outdoors. He loves that. A lot of people love that. He also has diversity of projects. He's doing all those things I said. He's doing fungicides, and herbicides, and insecticides, and, and a whole bunch of different things. He also, his, his output is data and information, and he gets to collaborate to achieve his goal. This is really important in industry. I think it's safe to say for all industries, it's very important to collaborate and to interact and work as a team uh, across the board. And he also gets to see things that are important to the grower. And this is something that's near and dear to my heart. I think the best thing I love about my job is at the end of the day, I actually feel like I'm doing things that have significance to growers. And uh, my PhD was fun and wonderful, and I got 10 publications out of it. But I probably didn't do anything for a grower. And other than Terry Niebleck and Bruce Jaffe and, and my colleague and myself, probably nobody's read those papers. But um, so anyway, here, here we are. He gets to work in a lot of different areas, some awesome crops. He gets to work in some, some grower-relevant settings. So sometimes we take things to a large plot. He also gets to test things in small plots. I mentioned sometimes things are crop destruct. Sometimes we're testing things and we want to, if there's phytotoxic, we, we don't want to burn a tree. We don't want to buy people's orchards. So we tag leaves, tag twigs, and test on a small scale. He gets to wear <coughs> high-tech spray gear. Um, he gets to get his hands dirty. So we, you know, we're out there in their field jobs. Also, he talked about how he gets to see things early on. So this is relevant to some, some work on uh, seed testing under controlled conditions in the greenhouse. And we do a lot of this, and we can test things. And then we can weed out the ones that don't work, we take the ones that do work to the field. And then you can see, do they really stand up in the field? And this is really important. As we all know, you can test things in the greenhouse, but you do eventually have to take it to the field. And he also gets to see what success looks like. I appreciate that. And, and then, this is great. I mean, you don't always see this, but, but this is great. This is one of our new products for grape growers and, and really significant to the grape industry. He also gets to hire some enthusiastic people. This is his daughter. And uh, this is not to be, indicate that uh, she works in environmentally hazardous, hazardous conditions, but uh, he's working with his daughter uh, putting flags out. And he also gets to work on some really different stuff. And uh, post-harvest fungicides, this is a business that I had the opportunity to bring uh, to Syngenta coming back from Switzerland. And it's a very interesting, very different. Um, so we've spent a lot of time with this. And Ryan certainly contributed to that. And it gets to smell a lot of moldy fruit. So Ryan's kind of a sick guy. Um, he also gets to experience different disciplines. So as I mentioned earlier, Ryan has to be a jack of all trades. He has to do entomology studies. He has to do plant pathology studies. And, uh, and 
anyway, I had to throw a picture of an insect in out of the kitchen. Um, and he gets to demonstrate what he's found. And these are all cool things. It's about communication. It's about doing good science. It's about planning. It's about he gets to see the countryside. In some cases, folks get to see the world. And he gets to haul around equipment. And he gets to analyze, summarize, and present his results. So these are this is just a journey, a photo journey, if you will, that I thought was really nice that Ryan, that Ryan put together for an EPS presentation several years ago. And I thought I couldn't do it more justice. Let's talk a little bit about molecular biology, jobs in molecular. First of all, does anybody recognize this, this person? It's Mary Del Chilton. Excellent. Mary Del Chilton actually works for Syngenta. She's <coughs> retired, but she doesn't know it yet. She keeps coming. And she, uh, in fact, there's a building named after her. Uh, and this is at our location in SPI in Raleigh, Durham. And I have a little picture I had with her name on it. I happen to have all these crazy people in front of it. Uh, and this is APS Council. Uh, they actually came and visited. We had an APS Council meeting at the site a couple years ago. And I think you can recognize a few in front of the faces. So, um, this is the SPI location that I was telling you about. So we just invested $70 million at this site in this new glasshouse facility and in new, new labs. This is like the mecca for biotechnology. I, I, every time I go visit, my, my pulse quivers. I want to I I go there. They've got a gym. They've got lots of young people and Eppendorf tubes and pipette men and, and this greenhouse facility, which apparently blinded several pilots and crashed several planes when they first clicked the lights on. It, surely they have, the, uh, they have the capacity to grow crops in every different climate, uh, equivalent to every different climate of the world. You guys, by the way, I have to say, a shout out, you have a really nice climate control rooms here, and you have a really nice microscopy. So this isn't that to be a computer stick. I'm just trying to show you what we have here. So there are lots of jobs. I've been told we will be hiring 20 scientists at this site uh, within the next two years. So that's good news for people who like molecular biology. You say 20 or 120? 120. And you know, and that's, that's why I'm excited to be here, because normally I get up and I talk about industry and get every jazz, and then they say, do you have any jobs? And I say, no. <laughs> and, and so they start throwing things. Um, this is the Vero Beach site. Um, this is a really excellent site. Unfortunately, it's our only remaining research site. We used to have several. We used to have six. Um, and due to uh, whatever reasons, they, they were downsized. But we do have this facility, and it's really good. It's a little challenging to grow corn in Florida, but uh, we can grow lots of crops there. We can grow corn there. And so you can see the, the, uh, the plots, and you can see very nice labs. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about molecular biology, because that's all I know about it. But there are jobs. There are people that are cloning. There are people that are groaning. There are people that have, are doing Western blots. There's lots of stuff going on. We've got traits. We've got, we've got a lot of genetics. We have a facility in, in Minnesota that it's all seeds. There are also, there's, a, there's something for everybody's passion, whether you like bed bugs or cockroaches or mice. There's rodent pest control. And also we have a lot of stewardship around things. We have to steward our products on the best way we can. And we, one thing I'd have to say about Syngenta is that we're clearly leading in stewardship. And we've got, we've got people that their full-time job is around bee health. So we're, we're looking at bee health. Um, and we have lots of other stewardship efforts. One thing that I thought was very, very cool, some years ago, we actually um, we actually bred for a rice that actually contained a uh, protein that's very important for ocular degeneration. And we gave it to third world country that was suffering. 50% of the population was suffering from blindness. And we gave it to them. And so we do lots of, we do lots of things that are, uh, that are stewardship and, um, what do I want to say, uh, helpful for the world. There are people that work in applications technology. We have lots of seed treatments, seed coatings. So I, I purposely didn't put in a lot of slides on our products because I'm not here to do an infomercial. I'm here more to talk about what we do. But we do have to coat those seeds with the products. We also have to, I mentioned post-harvest, so there's post-harvest opportunities. There are aerial application opportunities for certain crops. There's chemo. Uh, chemo irrigation uh, you know, and putting things out in, uh, in in furrow applications and spraying. So there's lots of application technology stuff, and we have experts in the field. 
We also, I didn't put it in here, but we also have experts in formulation technology. And I tell you, I have a video that I want to show, but it was too long. But in case you think you can just take a chemical and spray it on something and make it work, it be relevant, be wrong. And it wasn't until I saw that video that I recognized how important it is. Formulation chemists do everything from uh, antifreeze to distribution to, to make things that they don't separate. And you would be surprised. And, and, um, we also have lots of people that work in the flowers business. We have people that uh, Syngenta produces a lot of flowers. One out of every seven tomatoes is a Syngenta tomato. We also have the opportunity to work in places that I'm very bad at. Um, so lots of lots of the golf courses. When you watch when you watch the Super Bowl and when you watch uh, the Masters, you are seeing fairways and greens that have had a lot of Syngenta product and a lot of Syngenta care. So before I leave you with the idea that Syngenta and all chemical companies have a plethora of chemicals and we just, you know, we have more than we can use, I want to share with you two quick slides. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. But I want you to recognize what it takes for us to get there. First of all, in discovery, roughly some 100,000 chemicals usually are screened. So I talked about that early, early screening part. 100,000 chemicals are screened. From those, about 5,000 compounds make it through the profiling. 30 actually go into the evaluation, so these are actually making it into the field. And you know, I, I told you that a lot of this was toxicological work, and about one or two are supported. And what that means in terms of the timeline, okay, this says 150, so slightly bigger than the last number. <laughs> a lot of chemistry goes into the top of the funnel. We have to look at a lot of things. Synthetic chemistry, that takes one to two years generally. Two to three years, field screening, we weed it down, toxicological, ecological studies. Three to four more years, we get down to five or ten. Bi biological work, toxicology, ecology, economic profiling. Two to three more years, we get it down to watch, and one more year of sales. So we're up to eight to 12 years, and at the tune of $250 million. So it, it's not insignificant. So this is one of the reasons why we have to steward our products so much, because we don't want chemistry to develop resistance immediately. It's very important to us. OK, I want to talk a little bit about myths versus facts, because you know, a lot of people, when I, I've asked a lot of people today what they know about industry, and I've gotten a lot of blank looks. And, and don't feel bad, because you're in the in crowd, because that's what I get every time I ask that question. I ask it for a reason. But the thing is, when people don't know about something, it's easy to assume something. And so that's where we get into myths. And a myth is a misconception, an unfounded belief may influence people's decisions. And so I'm hoping that I can undo some of those myths. And usually it's not based on scientific evidence, but your personal experience, anecdotes, or things that you hear from other people. So the short list, I'm going to talk very briefly about it. And several people have asked about some of these already today. One is publication, one is scientific practice, job security, and then I've got miscellaneous potpourri, just because it's a fun word to say. Um, so publication, the Duke of Wellington, publish or be damned. So a lot of people think that it's impossible to publish if you work for any company. And that's, that's not true. Um, clarification, it's not required. So the good news is if you don't like to write, you really like industry because it's not something you have to do to increase in your professional uh, career. So you don't have to publish, but it doesn't mean you can't publish. Now, there are some things that you can't publish right away. There's certainly things that you can't publish until, you know, which, which drives some university folks crazy because we say you can work on it, but you can't publish it. And of course, your life's around publishing. Um, so I think that's where that myth comes from. But it doesn't mean that you can't publish if you work for industry. Some typical opportunities for publishing include new active ingredients, uh, products, uh, innovative uses, reviews, book chapters, uh, fundamental research collaboration that we do with universities, patents, and also stuff from the EPA. And in fact, uh, I've published several book chapters since I've been with Syngenta, and I've published many brochures, and I've published a couple journal articles as well. 
scientific practice, the perception is that the fundamentally difference, uh, differences in approach in the private sector versus the public sector, and this is really pretty much untrue as well. We, we do things with glass houses, labs, equipment that's pretty much identical to you folks, with the exception of maybe GLP studies, which require a little bit extra stuff. Um, you know, pretty much everything we do is the same. In some cases, we have superior equipment, but not always. And uh, but but the, the science is the same. Now, not all companies do science, so maybe that's where this myth comes from. Um, and I got these myths from uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Paul Kuhn. But the differences that we have is that most of the work we do is applied. Um, I've referenced reference to some of the folks today that I think industry have been referred to over time as nozzle heads. We actually don't take that badly, we just wear hats. Um, but uh, basically, we, you know, if, if being applied as a nozzle head, then yes, we're, we're guilty by association. But the reality is we do a lot of really good science along the way. Um, we work on multiple crops, diseases, projects simultaneously. So this is a challenging thing. So people want to come in and focus on one crop, on one pathogen, on one pathosystem, that's very unlikely. If you want to, you know, so this is where um, you'll hear people in the industry say you've got to be flexible, you've got to be diverse, you've got to be broad. That's what they're talking about. So multiple disciplines, I've already mentioned this a couple times, you end up working on herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. And then also sometimes you get requests to do things at a short notice. And they come in and it's really top priority. And so this is a little bit different. The projects also can have a shorter lifespan. So you can be working on something today, and we find out something that's, you know, it doesn't need a tox hurdle or, or something, and it's gone, and it's just it's too bad. And so you, you, it's good to have passion around what you do, but also be realistic and, and let it go. The next one is job security and change. And obviously, um, you know, so this is a quote more and more. It's extremely unlikely that anyone coming out of school with a technical degree would go into one area and stay there. Today's students have to look forward to the excitement of probably having three or four careers. Gordon Moore is the co-founder of Intel. Um, and you know what? That's probably not so unlikely. The belief is that there's a lack of job security within industries. And that's because companies downsize, merge, and, and that actually does happen. But so in contrast to academia, there is no tenure. Um, so we don't have that security. But historically, um, it's historically, often people stay with the same company for their whole career. And that's changed a lot, too. People go from one company to another. Um, and that, that has changed. And that will probably continue. Also, rationalization and consolidation has occurred quite a bit over the last 10 and 20 years. So that's where this myth comes from. And it's actually not helpful. Um, and that will likely also uh, not change, but the reality is good guys usually, cream floats at the top, usually the good people stay, um, and when there are job changes, a lot of dead wood is chopped, and I know it doesn't sound very uh, sympathetic, but it, it's the way it is. So if that's something you can't live with, then the industry is not the place for you. Lots of opportunities also come from this, and, and a great example for me was that when we merged to form Syngenta, it gave me an opportunity to go to Switzerland. And that wouldn't have happened without that. And so these are things that if you're willing to be flexible and think it broad, you can change and do those different careers. In fact, I've done three, so I'm probably almost done with my career. All right, getting near the end here, um, I'd like to talk about a few things that you might do to prepare, prepare for a career in industry should you be so enticed. Um, so grad students really need to understand the big picture. You need to really understand production agriculture the best you can. That, that would really help you. you. Need to have multiple disciplinary knowledge, so entomology, plant pathology, agronomy. And the more you can know about overall total agriculture would behoove you. you. Need to be flexible for all the reasons that I mentioned. Flexible in the fact that jobs change, flexible in the fact that projects change. You need to understand plant physiology. This is becoming much more important. Syngenta and I would willing to say across all companies, there's much more emphasis on understanding how plants respond to various chemicals in terms of being better yielding, 
responding to drought, responding to uh, environmental stresses. You need to be a team player. Effective communication is really, really big. Uh, we need innovative people. I mean, really, it's all about innovation and, uh, and leadership. So what is industry looking for? Well, obviously, this is very similar to what I just told you in Dr. Kennedy. I would say most companies are looking for people with a broad background, applied people in agricultural practices and disease control and entomology. And so when I say disease control, I mean, I mean across the board. You need to be motivated. We're looking for people that are willing to go the extra mile, people that really have that get it done attitude. I said it about 24 billion times today, communication is really big. For science to be successful, it must be tested properly, and we're looking for that in good science. For scientists to utilize and understand it, it must be communicated, and most importantly, our scientists is to interpret and present results. You need to be creative. True innovation and strategic planning come from creativity and thinking out of the box. And personally, we need a lot more of that than we have. And personality, personable. Um, and I can, I can tell you some stories, I can tell you horror stories, people that we interviewed that were really good people. Yeah, it's no people skills at all. And maybe I'll tell you from our beer. Um, but uh, it's really important. I mean, we're in a business, and you've got to you've got to be personable. Okay, so are you the right person for the challenge? I've told you a lot of this stuff. The ag industry is an exciting field for me. Doesn't mean that it will be for you, but it could be. Um, we have lots of jobs coming along, and that is true across the board. And it's not always who you know, or what you know. It's it's also who you know. And I'm saying that, so I've said this many times today too, it's good for you to network with people. And in fact, one of the best things you're doing right now is networking. You're networking right now, and thank you for that. Thank you, Terry, for inviting me, and thank you, Peter, for hosting me. And to be enthusiastic. Show your enthusiasm, and I think you'll appreciate it. And that is my last slide. I'm happy to entertain any questions that we have, either campus, and I'd like to first thank both Dr. Niebleck and Peter for the invitation and hosting me. And I'd also like to thank all of you uh, for, for your hospitality and for visiting today. I really appreciate it. It's been a great time. In fact, I, I actually thought this was a job interview when I saw the, the list of people I was visiting. With. So, so let me know if I got the job. Any questions? Um, you, sh you showed a nice picture of a field scientist in a beautiful apple orchard in, in California. Are field scientists in other locations that are less appealing environmentally also uh, very willing to do their job and happy about their job? Absolutely not. That's why we do no research in those places. No, <laughs> no it's, a, it's a great question and uh, it certainly um, Yes, I did show you an area that's beautiful, and that's a picture that Ryan Bounds put in his presentation. But recognize that most of the people that we have actually are geographically located in areas that you want to be, and if they're not, they actually have opportunities to move. But a lot of the people that we have in the geographies that they're at, are, they're actually located in areas where they grew up, they're actually located in areas that they have family, they're actually located in areas where they're, they're very happy with the crops that are there. And so, um, so yes, I mean, not everything's going to look look like uh, an apple orchard in California for sure. But uh, but I think most of the field biologists actually are very happy with what they do or they wouldn't do it for, for long. Um, but it's a good question. Another question? I have one in Columbus. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for your very nice talk. I'm wondering about the how work. I, I admit to being totally ignorant. I, I worked in the USDA for a while and I understood the hierarchy there. And so how, for example, how does the company decide what what areas they're going to, you know, throw a lot of resources, whether it's money, people, effort? How does that happen? 
Yeah, sure. No, that's an excellent question. So, you know, we go through uh, a lot of a lot of uh, growing pains on the, on the whole process. So we have projects that are put in, and you got to recognize it. You know, I, I talk very generally about things that I'm familiar with, but we have projects that go across the board in genetics, breeding, and traits. But so let, let me again to answer your question. Just go down to what my, my my competence, which is fungicides. So obviously there are a lot of fungicide products projects that we want to fund. And we can't fund them all. And we're competing against all these other projects as well, insecticides, herbicides, across the board. So we actually put projects in, and they have to have a business case with them. So we have marketing managers that put a business case with each of those so that they actually go through a fairly extensive uh, process of due diligence on what ones are the most important to do. And that's why I also said, we don't do a lot of work on some of the really minor crops because it would never make a hurdle. So there's got to be a hurdle. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, we have to make money on this. So we're not going to be you know, developing all our products out of radishes. Um, although I like radishes, we're going we're to develop it on the crops that make sense. So it does go through a process. And that process is quite extensive. It's, it's reviewed in Basel, Switzerland. It's reviewed. It's, it's actually um, prioritized here first and then sent to Basel, Switzerland, and then Basel, Switzerland tells us what we have wrong, and send it back to us, and uh, we correct ourselves. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, another question? Yeah. Could you comment about uh, the issue of compensation these days, the trends in the industry for salaries and so on? OK. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be fairly general, because I, you know, I, I don't know. I would have to say that compensation probably is higher in industry than it is in academia. But I'm not sure. Um, that, that might be wrong, but I, I, that would be my guess. And uh, across the board, you know, you know, one thing is we have a salary, but also if we are successful in our business goals, we actually get a pretty compensable bonus, which actually is, is really quite nice. Which, uh, but but you know, in terms of dollar figures, I don't know because it varies company to company across the board. But I would I would just have to say it's going to be higher than the university uh, salary. We have questions here. I have one more in Columbus. <laughs> um, how much um, can you comment on, on how much emphasis you guys place on products used by organic farmers? Product, products used by organic farmers? Um, well, I'm not sure what organic farmers might use other than sulfur. Um, we used to sell sulfur, by the way, um, but we gave sold that business. Um, you know, I'm not really sure what a lot of organic uh, farmers use. I will say that we can't feed the world with organic farming. Um, but I'm not against organic farming, but we can't feed the world with organic farming. But uh, I don't think they use a lot. That's why the products look that way. <laughs> Sorry. Let me to follow up on that question, because Sinjenta has the Sinjenta bio line. Oh, yeah. And maybe uh, you can mention a little bit of that. Okay, yeah, so Syngenta BioLine actually is a biological uh, biological control. Um, actually, it's a business that we have. Um, it's located out in California. And for a long time, that was our only biological control. That was largely for insects. We actually have expanded that quite a bit over recent years. We now have biological control for, uh, for various crops. So we have uh, Aflagard, which is a atoxygenic strain of Aspergillus flavus, which mitigates Toxins and corn, and peanuts. We also have a biological that is Pastoria, and it's it's basically for biological control nematodes. It's in addition to those products that we have for insect control and bio line. That answer your question. Um, this might be hard to answer because of the diversity of opportunities you talked about, but when you're looking at a CV of uh, someone with a master's or a PhD coming out of school. Uh, say for the research and development type jobs, what are some key CV items or areas that you look for, like in terms of people's research, teaching, extension experiences? Can I hear that? Um, yeah, so, so it's an excellent question. So what, what I always tell people is the first thing that you have to get a, an interview is your CV. So get it right. You know, don't, don't goof that up. Um, make sure you don't have spelling mistakes. Uh, make sure you have a good-looking CV. Make sure you sell yourself. Um, you know, 
you and, and, and even if you put it on your CV, make sure you sell yourself if you get that interview. Make sure, don't don't assume that I'm going to read your CV and I'm going to know you're the best at this or that. Or Tell me that. You need to always sell yourself. It's about marketing yourself because if you don't, nobody else will. Um, what can you put on there? I would I would put on anything that you think is relevant. In fact, I often, I haven't looked for jobs in a long time, but if I were to look for a job, and when I was looking for jobs earlier, I used to actually tailor my CV for that job. So I'd read what that job is about, and I'd see, we're looking for this, that, this, and that. And I'd make sure that I addressed each of those somewhere in that CV, and probably up top, so that you would see it first and go, oh, it's got that, it's got that, it's got that. And so you want to address what people want, people want. Don't sell yourself short, don't have spelling errors. Um, and uh, just be up front, and, and don't be too verbose, you have the right but, but get to the bottom line. What is it that you do? Why are you the one that we should be in the for an interview? And why are you the one we should hire? I hope that helps. So, in fact, I took the slide out. I shouldn't have, but I did it. Um, we we work on several. Uh, we work on corn, soybeans, wheat, potatoes, uh, rice. And I'm going to leave something out. We we work on the big, big crops, and and you know tomatoes and and, and and the grapes and the tree nuts and vines. So we work on those crops. What I, what I mean is, you know, um, this is a bad example. Of, uh, um, um, well, yeah, I will use it. You know, we don't work on ginseng, but thanks for Mary Barbacek, we've got a label of every fungicide and Syngenta's portfolio on ginseng because she's, she goes through IR4 and gets them supported. So you can get things done through IR4, but we we would not focus on a crop that I would say doesn't, and I'm, I can't remember the market value, but there'd be a business case that went with it. And these guys sit there and they go, if we were to put this fungicide on every acre, and then you do actually build this to come. So if we were to put it on 50% of the acres, if we were to put it on 20% of the acres, and if we were to put it on once or twice, what would that value be? And is it is the view worth the climb? And it's not, you know, a lot of my friends that work um, in some of the crops, you know, they're, like in sugar beets, they're not so happy because you know, they're fighting. And sugar beets are important. In fact, the reality is what crop you work on is important because it's important. So everybody, everybody wants to vote for their, their commodity. It's got to be, it's got to be uh, business sales. Uh, right. You're talking about the project proposals that you have know, to choose a project to fund. Who is actually on that team that writes them? Like, it sounds like it would be a business person, scientist, field scientists. Yeah. So, so that's a great question. What we do is we actually, we actually have um, idea creation. So we encourage every. But everybody, they can go online and they can submit ideas. So they say, I think we should develop this mixture of this and that for this. I think we should do this. I think we should do that. And they go in and we get this just bloody god off a huge list. And then people go through and, and, and so then it goes into uh, to my camp. So it goes into I mean, the marketing group. So and, and it, well, for, actually before that, it goes to we have um, crop teams. So we go to the crop team that's relevant for that crop. And if it goes across crops, it would go to several of them. And then it would come to us, and if we if it's supported, then our marketing guy would have to sit down and, get, and, and put together a business case if we support it. So it goes through several levels of due diligence. Does this make sense or not? And then if it does, then we have a business case, and then it gets prioritized, and then it gets funded or it doesn't get funded. Does that make sense? So it sounds like the efficacy work is already done before you can get to the Well, sometimes. I mean, it, so it depends on the project. So, yeah, I mean, and, and that's the other thing, you know, one thing I've learned is it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission, so often it's better to actually generate some data if you can, and then say, here, <laughs> you know, this works, we, we approve it. Um, but uh, but, but it, it's not always the case. So sometimes people come up with crazy ideas and say, we need this, and this will really be beneficial, and this will be beneficial because soybean is six nematode, and this could be beneficial because of it. And, you know, and, and even if it's not proven, we, we do a little bit of testing, so, so that's the other part as well. So that brings up another question. How often do you use or utilize a lot of the crop loss disease assessments, and how important are those disease assessments and diagnostic reporting and things like that? 
Well, I, I would say our company probably vastly underutilizes them, but I, I, I have vested interest in that. It's in sort of an EPS council, it's a council at large, and we're looking at, at that whole process right now with impact statements. And, and the whole idea there is understanding what is the, is the contribution of controlling certain diseases to to the economy so that we can get legislators to actually utilize dollars to support plant pathology. So I think it's huge, and we're putting a huge effort into it, um, trying to make that a relevant thing. I'd love to talk to you more about it, because to me that's, that's, that's big. Do companies use it? I would say probably not to our benefit. We love that information. We absolutely love that information. In fact, most of our marketing guys just use, utilize domes. And domes has some, some values, but it's, it's limited. Will. Will they call you? One eight hundred doors. Does that work? I'll try to. Do you sponsor existing non Americans? What percentage of people sponsor here? Yeah, so, yeah, we, we do. So, in fact, um, I, I don't know what percentage. I absolutely have no idea. Um, in, in fact, I'm not in hiring nor recruiting. But, um, we do have people that, we, so we hired somebody in data management, um, I guess five years ago now. She was actually great, and, 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 we, and this happens with several people, but she just comes to mind. And she was from India, and we take care of all of the, you know, the pieces of the paperwork and all that. You know, so we make sure that we get the people that we want and, and help them, so we, that's not a uh, limiting factor. Absolutely, I absolutely think the future of transgenic plants is actually bright. I think so. So, in fact, the funny thing about the, the cool thing about talking about the future is it's, it's totally subjective, and I can be totally wrong, and you don't care because you don't know yet. But I do think that that is absolutely the case. Um, in fact, to think of the future, think of the past and where we are now. And I know it's been a rocky road, but I think we've made significant pathways. And I, do, I can't think that transgenic plants will not be accepted eventually. It's, it's a really tough road, uh, particularly in Europe. Um, you know, I went over to Europe. Um, my first trip to France was to Lille, France, to go to a potato conference. And uh, this was a really interesting conference, by the way. Because um, it was potatoes, but it was everything potatoes. So speakers talked about starch, uh, to where you put potatoes in the, in the grocery shelves, too. This one guy who gave a brilliant talk after lunch all the French people drank about 12 bottles of wine. Um, and, and he gave a great talk about all the proteins he's expressing in potatoes for late life. I was like, this is fantastic. And all the hands went up and the questions were tabloid. Absolutely. I mean, I wish I recorded that. I wish we had YouTube back then. And uh, so anyway, it was tabloid. And we've moved PEG quite a bit. We have lots of, lots of transgenic plants that are available now. And although, there are people complaining about uh, getting these into the trade in China. That's going to change. In my opinion, that, that has to change. Clearly, to take away that benefit for growers is it, absolutely So I think it's going to change. One question. Are you talking about the stewardship yeah. um, efforts? What, how, do, how are those decisions made and what to make a product available to places that need? All of it's a matter of people like request these sorts of things. So, so make sure I understand the question. Right. So you, you're asking when we're developing a product, um, or you're asking or about just I guess yeah, like how are those decisions? Like you said with that example of the rice, or the climate, or the population. Yeah. Do, do people come to you and request that, or is this a, like a top-down decision where they see a period? No, I don't. I don't know the truthful answer, but I do know. So we we used to participate in. Um, and I know I don't have the name of the tip of my tongue. Uh, it was a s sustainable project. And a good friend of mine, when I was in Basel, Switzerland, spent a lot of her life over in Africa. And, uh, and Syngenta was right at the table. And, and 
it's all about feeding the world and it's all about doing things that make sense. And I do know when we developed that rice, um, I'm sure the idea was to give it away at first, but we recognized that there was greater value in terms of social implications to give it away than there was to, to sell it, and they couldn't afford it, so we gave it to them. And so, so where that decision came from, probably somewhere up high, I don't know, it wasn't my decision, but I think it's a great decision. And we do a lot of anthropo anthropomorphic, is the right word? Anthropological. We do a lot of nice things. <laughs> we do a lot of good stuff. And, and, uh, and, that's, and that's nice. And, and that's something that, I mean, clearly, I see value in Syngenta because we do you know, science based science sound, and we do things to help the world, and we're trying to feed the world with less. And, and so every day I wake up, I feel, I feel like at least I'm doing something. I like what I do. In case it didn't show. I'm curious, uh, how does Syngenta approach the management of resistance? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, Syngenta is extremely proactive about resistance. We, uh, we take it very extremely, extremely seriously. We have probably, I'm not even going to say probably, scratch that. We have the best resistance management scientists in the world. We have people over in Stein, Switzerland, and that's their day job. And they do stuff, they give talks that I don't understand, they, but it's really, really, really good stuff. Um, we used to have, um, uh, what's his name? Um, I'll think of it a minute. Um, we used to hire a guy who's a professor at the University of Basel, and uh, his name will come to me in a minute. Um, Ulrich Gysi, Dr. Ulrich Gysi, and he also worked for us, so he wore two hats. He was absolutely brilliant. He was on top of the scientific ladder. We have a scientific ladder in Syngenta. So these, this, not all companies do that either. So these are people that we recognize for their scientific achievements, because they don't probably leave their job. They stay in their job, and they're excellent. And you don't want them to leave their job. He finally retired, so he had to leave the job. But we also have Ulrich Gysi. Uh, we have Ulrich Gysi. We have, uh, what's his name? Harry, uh, Lots of it doesn't matter. Um, it's fried my brain. Um, we have lots of good people doing work on resistance. We also, on every single one of our labels, we have resistance language. We also are very proactive about people using the product the right way so that we don't develop resistance. You saw how long it takes, how much it costs. It would absolutely be stupid for us to, to behave any differently. So to us, it's all about resistance. It's all about making sure that people use those relevant way, even if we're saying don't use our product because we don't want resistance. So we take it very seriously. Anyone else has a question?